Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School. I also hold two fellowships right now, one at the Business School and one at the Newcomb um, Institute at Tulane. And I just want to quote. So uh, we had a delightly, delightful evening with uh, Dr. Jocelyn Song- Song- Songer. She is remarkable. Um, she is the founder of MakerMask.org. She is also um, a uh, biomedical engineer. She is um, she has outdoor experience in backpacking and uh, emergency services and breathing. And she has so much to offer us. And she's been testing masks. And she's got a really a strong belief on what material we should be using for masks. And we went for an hour, and then we decided we needed to chat more, and then we chatted another hour and a half. So this is part one of two of a very long and in-depth conversation with um, Dr. Songer, and she is she's amazing. She's going to be our keynote speaker for our Homemade Mask uh, Virtual Summit um, this coming week, um, and she's she's amazing. Hi, hey, I'm Dr. Jocelyn Songer, and I'm calling from Orange, Massachusetts. Awesome. And we ask everybody this question, which is, do you have any memory of anyone sewing or quilting in your life? And if so, what? Yep, absolutely. So both my mother and my grandmother sew. My grandmother was a seamstress. And so she would look after me and I pestered her forever to try to let me use the sewing machine, which at eight years old probably was never going to happen. Yeah. (laughs) But she did let me use a needle, and she and I worked together to make dolls. Nice. So she helped me make little patterns. I would draw them out, and then she'd send me back to the drawing board a bazillion times. But eventually, she, she'd kind of zip one together and then let me sort of do the finishing work. And so I have lots of fond memories. That's very that. nice. That's very nice. Um, okay, so we're going to ask one more question, which is what was your life like? say November, December, (laughs) like, you know, before, like we're, we are, um, recording on June, Monday, June 8th, 2020. So six months ago, who were you? What were you doing? What was your life like? Yeah. Six months ago, I was sort of balancing my work, um, on neuro, neuromodulation and neuroengineering, biomedical engineering. Okay. With backpacking. Okay. So tell us a little, well, tell us a little more about both. So ex- tell me, tell us what that is and, and a little bit about your path of how you got there. All right. So my background is biomedical engineering and electrical engineering. And I've always been passionate about health and helping other people and have maintained kind of certifications as a first responder. And then I'm very geeky and have a very science and engineering mind. So I've applied my energies towards developing innovative clinical tools for diagnostics and also treatment. Um, Very cool. So give us an example so we can have a concrete understanding of like. All right. So a lot of the work that I've done has been on hearing and balance in the inner ear. And so understanding how a hole in your ear can make you lose balance. Really cool. So okay. interesting stuff. It Very suddenly cool. became relevant. How did, you, how did you get to that? How did you want to be doing that? I always wonder, people's paths are always so interesting, right? Like, um, Yeah. Yeah. So when I was young, I loved health and science. My mom is a nurse. And so I was passionate about that. And I saw a talk on the brain and what what is cooler than how the brain interfaces mm-hmm. with electronics and electrical devices. So that is what kind of nudged me in that direction. And early in my career, I got interested in the ear and the acoustics of sound because cochlear implants was where the brain met electronics the best. And that's kind of what pushed me in that direction. Uh And then there were some real world clinical 
challenges people were finding where this hearing and balance stuff was interacting. I'm like, what is going on there? So I studied acoustics Very of cool. sound and how it's produced and how you hear it. Cool. And that kind of led, led me into the brain. Very cool. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, so you're going along, you're doing your life, you're awesome, yeah. you're backpacking, it's great. Yeah. Um, then what happens? So I am asthmatic. Okay. Uh, and so I have to pay really close attention to when there are respiratory illnesses. Okay. Uh, getting big. Okay. And I flew to a conference in January and was already concerned about COVID. Yeah. And so had masks that I was bringing with me right. because all my backpacking work with forest fires and I've hiked across the U.S. three times now. Wow. So I've had to kind of have masks with me at all, all times or to be able to MacGyver masks, sort of make DIY hacks. You needed masks when needed. you were walking because of pollution? Or because of forest fire smoke. Forest fire smoke. Interesting. Right. And so hiking across really California, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, wow. Montana during forest fires when it's 24 7 and you can't get away from it because you don't have a house, you don't have shelter, yeah. you don't have running water like people are used to having. So you have to figure out how you're going to make traditional and non-traditional solutions come together yeah. so that you can breathe. And for me, breathing, uh, right. breathing is a privilege that most right. people don't think about very often because they can just do it. But since 2011, actually since 2009, but that's a longer story, um, I haven't been able to take breathing for granted. I get um, that. I have. I and have that me, was, yeah, I get that. Me either. So uh, for different reasons. Yeah. I had a, a couple of pulmonary embolisms and they didn't go away. So, oh, uh, yeah. so yeah, the not breathing is really awful. Like if you've experienced not breathing, it sucks, right? It, yeah. Like, gasping or trying to get air into your body is not fun. Uh, right. Very, and, uh, the brain, no, nobody likes, not, not, nothing about your body likes the fact that the, the breathing isn't going right. No, and it, it just changed, for me, it changed the whole way I had to interact with the world. Really? Because I had occupational asthma, so what I had to mean? do... That means that it, it was meant I was, job? I was literally allergic to my job. Really? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. What was so, your job? So my whole life kind of shifted yeah. what after... What was your job that was causing that? So I was doing research in a facility that had fuzzy furry critters really? and, and I became allergic to them over the course of five years, which happens to That's so weird. about 80% of people. And I was part of a small subset that went on to develop asthma. Really? But because of that, uh -huh. I have all this background and real world experience in particles and what size they are and how they disperse and travel right. because... I wasn't the one working with the fuzzy furry critters that I was most allergic to, uh -huh. but certain sizes of particles travel and distribute more. And I had to wear N95 daily for occupational work. So I had some real experience with how they are not always the most fun things to wear or the most comfortable. Right. Right. And then similarly, I hiked with N95s in the desert reusable ones while I was backpacking and so I watch TV now and I see all these people with masks that are worn improperly like just right. covering the mouth and not the nose and I'm like oh I so understand that right because it's it, too exhaust it's awful it, it's too exhausting and yeah. it can be uncomfortable so you kind of shift it and in the desert I did that with the smoke until because it would be hot and sweaty, but I needed something and it helped. And it sort of highlights some of the differences between when you're wearing a mask for infection control, essentially, in a pandemic, yeah. um, where the things that you do to cheat with 
forest fire smoke or other things where you're like, well, it's preventing me from breathing through my mouth, mm -hmm. but all that stuff is now coming out of your nose. So it, it is, I understand it. And every time I see it on TV, I go, oh, like so if you can't wear the mask, yeah. mask you need to wear, hmm, let me rephrase this. The most important thing about a mask is your willingness and ability to wear it yeah. when you need to be wearing it. So if it isn't filtering like an N95, if it isn't perfect, yeah. That's okay if it's a mask that you're willing and willing able to wear, to wear right. for right. the amount of time that you need to wear it. Yeah. So I feel like some of those human factors are things that don't get talked about very much. Yeah. No. And I have a, I modify my masks, like I make them, which helps. And I know the science really well, it. which yeah. also helps. Right. I have experience as a first responder. So I'm used to thinking about these things. Yeah. And my mom is a, she is a sewist, a good one. She used to work in factory sewing. Yeah. Um, she's not a quilter. She's not a quilter. And she's like, no, I'm not a good sewist because quilters, they really sew. <laughs> I don't know about, we only sew yeah. flat. That's the problem. Like we only know how to sew flat. Uh, right. You know, so that was, you know. The masks. So let's get into the mask itself. So we ha we've done some um, research on, and we've done some, we've been doing research, but we've mm -hmm. also um, uh, been talking to different people, industrial um, hygienists and all kinds of other people. Yeah. And we've learned about big particles and tiny particles and <laughs> electrostatic fabric versus oh, cotton and stuff. like all the right stuff that I right. really want to know that just tells us where, <laughs> where we're at. Tell us what your philosophy, what is, what is the goal of the mask? You, so for those that want to um, follow along, go to makermask.org. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's M-A-K-E-R and then M-A-S-K.org. Um, and you've got a resource that's science-based on creating masks. And what we're doing, we're creating, we're doing a summit next week, you probably know. Mm -hmm. um, and the goal is to sort of gather everything, what happened, what happened. But then all really, really, like there's so much science out there. And we really want to be able to make masks for our friends and family and communities and people like force responders if they need them again um but we it, there's too much science out there it's chaotic so tell let's talk about your science first and then i want to ask you a couple of questions about the science that came out um and see what your thoughts are all right okay so that's a very broad topic is so as you you're mentioned. using so you design it water resistant non-woven polypropylene and we just got sure. some polypropylene that's latex free mm -hmm. and can be machine washable, washable or disinfected by boiling or autoclaving okay so you're using so tell us a little bit about that um tell us like what that is and why that's important and sort of how you make your masks all right so i initially started from the infection control standpoint what we know most about COVID-19 and the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, which is mm -hmm. the virus associated with it, is that it's mostly transmitted through droplets, right? And so there's a whole long dialogue about the different forms of transmission. Right. But for droplets in hospital settings, it means that they wear surgical masks and gloves and gowns. And the surgical masks in those cases um, provide flash protection, droplet protection, which means it prevents water-based droplets from coming through, and those masks are water resistant. And so they're designed to block bigger particles, and, and especially particles that are in water. Right. Um, and so that's why I started looking for water resistant materials. It's just Very block interesting droplet so that you can contain keep your droplets to you and keep other droplets out got it That's okay barrier. and so you're That's using cool. polypropylene and it's really That's nice it. it's a great website because you're also suggesting what fabric or what is polypropylene on there right yeah yeah and and so i was used to thinking about polypropylene from backpacking yeah. because all of these synthetic fabrics and high-tech materials are really popular there but most of those materials are woven uh -huh. um with if you've been talking to lots of people who are talking about particles they're like oh the big stuff goes right through right 
the challenge is finding something that's water resistant. So it provides a barrier to droplets that's breathable. Right. Um, and that you can wash, clean, sterilize, disinfect. So you have to have the trifecta there. Right. And, and the reusable grocery bags, uh, right. non-woven polypropylene, and it's really hard to talk about because people are like, oh, no, I'm not going to put a bag over my head. And I'm like, absolutely, don't put no, a bag over just, your you're head. You're using the fabric. You're cutting it up. Right. And, and the key thing there is it's got to be breathable. If you're covering your mouth and your nose, if it's not breathable, don't use it. Absolutely. Rule number one. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. And it turns out that these reusable um, non-woven polypropylene bags, which I shorten and say NWPP, uh -huh. are designed to be touching food, which is good uh -huh. because they need some standards. Right. Um, they're designed to be washable so that they can be disinfected, even though most people don't realize that and don't right. think about yeah. it. Right. Um, and it's water resistant because you don't want the water and wet stuff from your food soaking into the bag. Right. So it met all of those criteria. And interesting. so that's, that's how I ended at non-woven polypropylene from the reusable bags. And it's because of that food grade component that made me select that relative to other th things. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it is fabric light, right? It feels like fabric and you can find it in all sorts of sources around the house. Um, Very preferably with the food grade, but then in other things like interfacing, which sewists are much more familiar with. Right, nobody's talked about then, that. That's craziness. Like, right, what about the interfacing? Right. Right. And so the interfacing is a non-woven polypropylene. It is. For me, Yeah. it is. Uh, most of it. So mm -hmm. there are lots of variations, but you can get non-woven polypropylene and interfacing. And the caution there is that most of the interfacing that people are used to, it's fusing interfacing. It is fusible. Right. So you want non-fusible? Right. So the non-fusible interfacing because the fusible has adhesives and, and that is bad breathing in adhesives is usually bad usually bad <laughs> right generally we and think of it as bad um and it doesn't so, wash so out. until i hear otherwise i say don't breathe in adhesives so you want <laughs> non whitney can you write this down because i'm going to panic and not wonder wonder later so you can have interface you know, non-woven interfacing that is not fusible. That's right. Okay. You're like the first person. Like I've been asking that the entire time. And stabilizer. Stabilizer's got to be great because no? Yeah. No. I don't know. So I I am I am a dabbler in sewing. You're a dabbler. Right? So, so what are you looking for like they have stabilizer that is you don't sew it in like it's you know what I mean like you don't you, I mean you don't iron it on it doesn't it's not fusible it's mm -hmm. like it's just it's either tear away or it's whatever like what you know so, different ways to so some of the some of the stabilizer is uh if it's kind of like the backing they use tear away for some embroidery projects yes. right yes um a lot of that is also non-woven polypropylene Okay. So the non-woven polypropylene and interfacing and stabilizer is yeah. different weights. Like yes, it is. Kind of like Thicker, all the materials. Thinner, right. Yes, they are. They're, if you hold on just a sec, I have a bunch of it. Let me just grab it so I can show oh, you. Oh, yeah. That bunch. would be perfect. You're like Thank the you. first. Like I've been asking this question. I just needed you in my life. This is so bizarre. I'm so happy you're here. Okay, hold on. Just oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I've been down the rabbit hole on non-woven polypropylene and looking at all the different kinds and all the different safety and engineering features. Because whenever yeah. you're making something, you want to make sure that you're not doing more harm than good. Yeah, I think that's why we want, we're trying to do the summit is because there are so many sewists and quilters out there who want to help and make masks, but there's so much information and some of it's conflicting and it's like, well, what do we do? Cause we just want to do the best thing. Yeah. And, and for me, 
as I said, like I want people to wear the mask that they're going to be comfortable with and that they can get or create. Mm -hmm. And so while a lot of people have been focused on, you know, making a zillion masks and getting them out as quick as possible, as a scientist and engineer and researcher, the thing that I can do is do the deep dive on all the science and think about it from the yeah. health perspective too. And yeah. I have so much information that figuring out <laughs> how to communicate it to people who are sewing masks wherever they are more effectively yeah. is, exactly. is a thing that I struggle with. So. All right, so you can just going to show it to you. This is this one, right? And this is soft, lightweight, tearaway stabilizer. We don't mm -hmm. know anything more about it. We don't know about how it's, we probably could look at the website. But it's not sticky, so that's mm -hmm. good. So then we still have to sort of see what it is, but it's non-woven. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can see the non-woven structure there. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Here. So, so you may actually be able to answer some of that. Yeah. yeah. Some of the questions I have about it. Okay. So although I shorten it and say non-woven polypropylene, yeah. the, the polypropylene in particular that I'm looking at yeah. and looking for is called spun bond. Spun bond. Um, Okay. Spun bombs. And that gets kind of into the nitty gritty of the details of how it's made. Uh -huh. But if you look closely at the bags, they have this like little dotted pattern to them that looks almost woven. Okay. And yeah. That, it's like, yeah, that's what you're looking yeah. for. This is flat. So this one, these right. are flat. So I think what you'll find is if you go to tear it, uh -huh. it tears more easily. And if you had some of this other stuff. Right. It does. Yeah, it does it tears really easily. You want it to tear easily, you don't want it to tear easily. No, I don't want it to you tear don't. easily. So, so the tear away is going to be a problem because you're not going to want it. You don't want it to be tear away. Yeah, that's super easy. Yeah. You, right. don't, want it, it you don't want it to easily tear. Right, because when if it tears easily, then it's not going to hold up as well to washing. Oh. But is right. it, if, it's, if it's a washing problem, let's say you just have mm -hmm. this and you're okay with it not washing well because you're like, I'm just going to throw, you know, you're just using one single use, then it would be okay. Mm -hmm. It's just the washing factor that you're concerned about. Is that right? Right. So durability. If you're going to wash it and try to disinfect it, mm -hmm. and if you're going to use it multiple times, especially if you're putting it in the middle layer of a mask, right? then you don't know how it's holding up. Okay. So what its properties want, are. So Whitney, this is what we want. We want polypropylene. We want what is it called? Spun bond. Spun, spun bond non-woven polypropylene. Non it's right. a mouthful. Yes, we want um, it to not it's... have not be iron on, not fusible, mm -hmm. and ideally not terrible. So we want it to be the least, the least science, you know, high tech of all of them, right? Because they're all like washable and fusible and no we want just like the basic one that doesn't have any extra bells and whistles right and if you're if you're on the web page yeah. there's a section called the research blog yeah and page down in there there's a page called the big four criteria for community right, i've seen that right yeah it's so really great. That one dives really into all, it. Yeah. All tell the, me a little bit about the fluid yeah. resistant test because that's really interesting too. So, um, yeah. So, in the US, for something to be called a surgical mask, it has to be fluid resistant. Okay. And the FDA has really strict definitions for what that means. Okay. And there's one specific test that it has to pass, which uses synthetic blood. <laughs> So, and that's for surgical mask classification. Okay. For most of us who are just trying to make masks for community use for our friends and family, right. um, water resistance is much more easy to check at home yeah. and see if it's going to provide some barrier to water. This is so cool. And you've got a DIY test on your site that you can experience it and try it, right? Right. Exactly. So the simplest version is you just flick water at it and you uh -huh. see if the water beads up on the surface, right? And if it beads up on the surface, it's hydrophobic and water resistant. And okay. if it absorbs into it, like paper towel, it's, the it's not. Okay. It's, hy it's hydrophilic. Yeah. Beyond and then yeah. with the mason jars, you can actually measure it and quantify it, which makes the scientist in me very happy. Very much so. Yes. 
measuring yeah. is important. Um, okay, so let's go back to the masks that you're making, and then I want to know. So you have cover, serge, and fit. So let's yeah. talk about serge and fit because cover is kind of a whole. That's covering the N95, and that's not really. I mean, you can read about it, but it's not really yeah. where we're at at this oh, moment. I think. Although I'll mention that the WHO has released new guidance yes. on fabric masks. Three layers. Three layers. Oh. Right, you're like, <laughs> I knew it. Uh, everyone else is like, what? Right? <laughs> and and non-woven polypropylene. Huh. Right, right. It's like they knew you. <laughs> it's, it's like they, they knew me. Yes. So um, one of the things with the cover is that you could use it over cotton masks if you wanted to have a That's layer. Like that's of water resistant. Of water resistant. Interesting. Over materials that are more okay. water absorbent. So awesome. So the surge mask on yours is mm -hmm. basically a surgical mm -hmm. mask. It's the pleated mask that everybody that a lot of people have been making. Right. But it's got the three mask. layers. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's got the the um uh pipe cleaner is across the top so that you can fit it, right? Just the top, yeah. but not the bottom. It's We're just, not worried about the bottom. The just the top. Um just the top. And it's, I've done some designs with it on the bottom, but how did it, it go? The, it tends when you get the pleats right, it fits pretty yeah, well it under. It does, right? Like yeah. you've seen that. It's just that this part is hard to figure out. And and you found right. the pipe clean you're like the person I need to talk to like three months ago. Like the pump the pipe cleaner, I was here three months ago. I know, ago. we just didn't know. We didn't know. It's like a sad love no. story, right? Like we never meet. The trains just keep going we never yeah. see each other. It sucks. Um <laughs> totally. So uh pipe cleaners. Do they wash okay? Are you worried about the washing aspects of them? That was my big question. Nobody could answer it for months now. <laughs> so uh, with the pipe cleaners, if you sew them in, yeah. they've been washing fine. Really? And what's on the surge guidance is two. I find it works better with three now because it makes it a little bit stiffer. You get a better fit. And you're putting and three, then, three together? or Three, three together. Three together. Yeah, I twist them it, together to make them, them together. stiff. I'm so um, beyond excited. I'm clearing my schedule. I'm making these. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. I'll also add that since the post came out, yeah. what I found I love to put in the nose pieces are the ties that go around coffee bags. You know the ones? They're kind of like twist ties, but they're wider. No, anyway, yeah. I can try to yeah. find oh, some links. I like those. Oh, um, Professor TG, yeah. I don't mean to cut oh, off, Alex but is Alexa? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Hi. So, so there are a number of different things you can use to sort of stiffen yeah. across the nose, as yeah. long as it kind of fits and then... Hey, Lex. Thank you so I... much for joining us. And this is amazing. This is like the best interview. I think the best interview so far. We've done like 70 <laughs> of them. I'm so if sorry. only I had met you first, we would have done none of the other interviews. No, just kidding. Um, so yeah, this is awesome. So okay, so we're, we're um, so Lex to catch you up. We are looking at um, uh, the surge mask on MakerMask.org, and we're talking about mm -hmm. polypropylene. What I think is really interesting is you do three layers, and they're all polypropylene layers. You're not doing a cotton layer. How do you feel about cotton? Because everybody's all been quilting cotton, 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 cotton. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. Um, oh boy, do I have thoughts on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. So when it, when it comes to cotton, co the nice thing about cotton is everybody has it, right? Yes. So for all these other materials, um, we've had challenges with sourcing the materials and getting them. Right. So initially, the masks that you could get and get at people wearing as quickly as possible were the best. Yeah. Cotton tends to be absorbent. Which is bad, um, and, right? Is that bad? Which is, it, it's complicated. So I think absorbent is bad for the outer layer of the mask because what I want to do is make sure that I have a water resistance layer that isn't going to... So at least one polypropylene layer on the outside. Yeah, at least one polypropylene layer on the outside. That way, if anything with moisture comes at you, it and shed and fall off mm -hmm. and your moisture that's trying to go through doesn't spread like your droplets don't spread beyond the other side either okay so do mm -hmm. you how do you feel about cotton on the inside 
I, I am okay with cotton on the inside. So cotton on the inside is more comfortable for a lot of people because they're used to it. Uh -huh. um, it absorbs the moisture, so it kind of keeps it inside close to you inside right but it's uh, your own moisture so it's okay it's but not it's something... your own uh, yeah it's your own moisture and if that's more comfortable for people then that's good mm -hmm. and if people are worried about the synthetics right um touching their skin that's also okay, okay. i still recommend and prefer a non-woven for all three, three layers, layers. Okay. um and part of that gets into the washing and cleaning and drying Coming. aspect why? So non-wovens dry faster, whether it's from your own moisture or from washing. Mm -hmm. um, it dries really quickly. And so that's less time that you have warm, moist environments for things to grow in okay. and all. So what that's... About, yeah. Okay. So, and you have very, you, on your site, it's like three different layers. You could see the three different layers. Are you using different things on, or are they just three different layers of the... Tell me what you're doing. So I prefer using different weights of non-woven polypropylene for the different layers. Okay. So the default instructions just say use three of the same yeah. because up until now, we haven't had a lot of variety in where we can get non-woven polypropylene materials from. Right. Right. So if, if you only have the, the non-woven polypropylene bags and you use that for all three, I prefer the non-woven polypropylene bags aren't as soft and comfortable as the non-woven polypropylene in garment bags and some other sources, mm -hmm. it's lighter weight and more comfortable. So you're putting the softer ones closer to your skin. It's, it's softness, not protectability. They're both, is it? Right. right. The, the innermost layer of the mask for me is mostly about fit and comfort. Okay. Right, so what makes it most comfortable for you? And I rely on those other layers to provide the barrier and filtration and all of those other features and factors. So and I interesting. increase the number of layers if I want more particle protection, essentially. To what? How, like, like how, far, how, how far do you go? <laughs> so I... The very first thing that I did after sort of developing the masks and designing them and proposing them and researching the, the heck out of them yeah. was send them down to a tour labs in Florida, get breathability did. testing done I on did. them. See, this is the other thing that I've been, Whitney's like, yeah, she's just been moaning about this the whole time. Like we've got to <laughs> yeah. have a way to test them because like we're making them, but we don't even know how, how good they are. So you took yours right. and you tested them. That is awesome. Yes, I got the, the breathability testing and I have been searching for all the other testing ever since. And and where I haven't been able to get professional testing done, I've come up with DIY procedures to sort of test all the critical elements. Right. The, for, yeah. for the professional lab testing, um, we got ATOR labs uh, to work with us and they provided breathability testing, inhalation resistance, exhalation resistance, CO2 accumulation um, for all of our mask designs and, and our material. how did it go? Went well. <laughs> uh, that, that was what kind of slowed the initial, I wasn't willing to put this stuff out there until I had data saying that it was least, at least breathable. I appreciate That's my, that. Like, number one minimum it's breathable right. we've gone through we've looked at the safety data sheets yeah and like we've thought about the different potential hazards and we're confident that we're not going to do more harm than good right okay so for for us we were able to get that i tested up to five layers of the non-woven polypropylene and they passed the sort of niosh breathability criteria and uh the WHO guidance references a French standard, standard AFNOR standards, um, and they also all pass that as well. And I've got some of that data up on the web page, yeah. although yeah. I haven't been able to get it all written up, but yes. So let's talk, okay, so I have, I wanna do two more categories. I wanna talk about fit, and then I wanna talk about the other studies that have come out. 
Mm-hmm. Let's see what you think about them because I'm a little bit frustrated by them. And I'm curious if you feel the same way or not. So let's talk first. You say yes, I do. Yeah, you are. <laughs> well, let's see. I'm telling you, I needed you in my life. Lex, you've changed everything. Um, okay. So tell me about fit because we have heard that the fit is really important because the – that if it doesn't fit right, then it goes down really fast. The percentage of protecting goes down really fast. So what have your thoughts been about that? That big sigh that you may or may not have heard is yeah. my major thought about that. But the challenge here is you have to know what it is that you want your mask to do for you. Yeah. Because masks are like shoes. Right. Sometimes you wear sandals. Sometimes you wear sneakers and sometimes you wear mountaineering boots Yeah. and you wear them, do different things. And the same shoe doesn't fit everybody. Right. And that They're is all problem, these right? factors. I mean, right. So we had, um, and Lex, we, I'm going to ask you to see if you want questions too, but I'm like totally obsessed. So we saw with the Olsen mask and these other masks that are flat, People mm-hmm. thought they're very cool and interesting. They're like the cool ones. But we also found that like they didn't fit very well. And it, you had to have the right face and the white mask so that we went back to surgical because we didn't know right. who was going to be wearing them. And at least right. we had this part. And if you put a nose thing in, but like it was yep. a better fit. Like my, my right. husband who has big head. I know I keep saying this. So I feel really bad. So he has a really nice, nice big head. And my daughter right. who's got small head, we wanted them to fit both of those because we just didn't know who was, we were giving them out to people. People. Right. Um, so, exactly. Yeah. So your so, so that pulls back. I'm going to mention a thing I forgot to mention before, which is when I wash the ones with pipe cleaners or any other nose bridge, yeah. I put them in a lingerie bag. You do. Oh, interesting. Wash That's them. smart. Yeah. Because because it, otherwise chaos. nose yeah. pieces get bent. All, yeah. 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 All yeah. That's good to know. Actually. Interesting. Do you, right. and, and then so, wait, I know we have like thousand things to ask. The yeah. other thing that we'll make sure we get back to the everyone was talking. The whole filter pocket thing. I'm really curious what your thoughts are about that. All right. That ties into the fit. Yes. Like so let's talk about the that. mask yeah. in terms of when you're talking about airflow and I think of it in terms of acoustics as well. And right. I'm an engineer with both mechanical and electrical background, I guess. Right. But essentially the air is going to follow the easiest path, kind of like water. So if you pour water down right on yeah. the sink it'll it'll take the easiest path there so if you have a really good filter in the middle of the mask and it doesn't go all the way to the edges of it the air is just going to go out and through the edges Got and it. if it doesn't fit well on your face the air is just going to go out the sides or up through the nose yeah around the eyes and i'll just mention really briefly that that nose piece is super important in that respect yeah because if you don't have that nose piece, the air is preferentially going to be going in and out through through the space by your eyes. Got it. Right? And pulling all the air you're breathing in through past your eyes is a bad idea for infection control. Right, because people are really and worried about eyes and, and contam- contamination through your eyes. That's right. So all these people <laughs> show these videos of them uh, with a mask on and trying to blow out a candle and they're right. really excited because they can't blow out the candle with the mask on. Yeah. And I just do a face palm on that because I can watch the air going out the sides as they breathe because none of the air is going through the mask. So if the air isn't going through the mask, it's gonna where is it going? Right. And it's, what it means is it's found an easier path out the sides or down the bottom or around the eyes. So showing that you can blow out a candle Not good. without the mask so on. So does the polypropylene well, ones allow the, the air to go in and out, but not the particles? Is that the idea? Is that it's uh-huh. keeping the little particles out, but the air yep. back and forth in and out? That's right. And, that, and the water out. So and the water out. Because when, when the particles are in the water, okay. which is what droplets are, they're... Yeah. Right, droplets of, well, we all know, <laughs> but they contain the particles. So if you're keeping those droplets out and you have water resistance, yeah. keeping the water out, but allowing the air to go through. Okay. And that's a balancing act. Same okay. thing with the particles, keeping the particles out, allowing the air to go through. And then the fit is making sure it's nice and tight here with the pipe cleaner and then 
I think that the, the um, straps, you're using straps and not elastic. Yeah. We did too because it yeah. was a better fit. Like the elastic Absolutely. was a chaotic mess in our house. Big head, yeah. little head, wasn't working. But the straps worked really, really well. Right. And you can individualize straps as well so that you can adjust for different head sizes, as you were That's saying. Exactly we and said. elastic, it stretches, right? So as your face moves, the mask moves and shifts. Got it. And having the ties help prevent that. Yeah. And the other issue is latex. So most elastic you get contains latex. And so one of the real, the first reason why we've moved away from using elastic is because so many people in healthcare settings have latex allergies. And because it's occupational, because they've had so much, they've been around latex so much that they get the, they get the allergies. Yeah. So, the, so there's another whole line of research, but for people who are making masks for other people, the elastic that you usually get for sewing mm -hmm. contains latex. Yeah. All right. So okay. we are... I know Circling we got a lot. Through. I know, I know. It's terrible. All because sorts it was of like topics here. it's like Christmas here. It's just I'm beyond excited. Uh, I'm like, yay, there are right? people that are interested and excited and way going, into it. Like every single person making math should be listening to you. Seriously. <laughs> Lex, do you have questions? Well, I gather my my composure back because I'm too too excited. <laughs> yeah, so I I'm so sorry that I had some connectivity issues at the beginning and I hope mm -hmm. I didn't miss this. Um but what do you think about non-woven interfacing? Because that's something that people that. have. Yes, we talked oh, about okay. that. And she, and, but it's a good summary because I think, I think, let me see if I got it right, which is yes, <laughs> but not uh, fusible because it's got glue and right. not terrible because it's not as strong when you wash it. But in anything, but poly, polypropylene is mm -hmm. that's how it's made so interface and stabilizer and all of those things are totally good right and then it's just a matter of as, as you were saying the durability if it stands up to being washed and I haven't been able to, to do those experiments because the only interfacing I have is fusing <laughs> interfacing yeah and I haven't been able to get it um and then kind of one of the challenges with all of these homemade masks and masks that are from alternatively sourced materials is that if you say cotton, that describes a ginormous range yeah. of things. And so, the same thing for polypropylene, it describes a big range of things. Okay. So how do we, so the, so there was a study that came out that was like, mm -hmm. use chiffon and use this and blah, blah, blah. First, they all went to Joann's and Walmart, which is totally weird. And then also they didn't really, there was, from a sewing point of view, it, there was not enough specificity for us to really be able to use it. And right. at the same time, this whole thing of like electrostatic, not man-made fabric, plus a cotton, how do you feel about all of that? So I agree. One of the real challenges for all of our mask making efforts, regardless of which materials you're using, is standardizing to know that material yes. you're using is the same as the neighbor down the street and that right. the guidance is applicable and useful. Right. I have to, and, I'm going to interrupt you because I was so irritated because I'm like, you are a scientist. Like, how could you have done this to us, right? Like, you took all this time mm -hmm. to do this study, but you didn't, your data set is sucky. Like, what is that about? Like, I was right. so frustrated. It was like, you, a scientist, like, why did you do this to us? Anyway, continue. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and part of that is because the scientists are doing a lot of what everybody else is doing, which is finding the materials that they have, you know, available right. at home because you're... They don't know. They don't know. Buy. They don't know it. Right. And they don't know. Fabric. Right. I felt I felt like there was a discourse disconnect of like... Absolutely. And like, why aren't you asking the sewists? Mm -hmm. We know a lot of stuff. We could tell you. Like, there's a... Like, they found a flannel that was like, had a percentage of, of like... Um, it wasn't a hundred percent cotton flannel, but we all have a hundred percent cotton flannel. Like try to find one that has like a percentage of some man-made thing. Like that's bad flannel. Like the whole point was like, <laughs> right. what is going on here? You know, anyway, well, and, sorry about oh, get, get me started on this. So <laughs> what we haven't talked about is that as a backpacker, I've done a whole bunch of research into fabrics and materials to make my own gear. Very cool. So I have a stack of all these high tech fabrics that yeah. are ultra light and water resistant and windproof and all these different 
different things. And that gets you into the language that people use to describe fabrics. And that is a real challenge. The amount of time that I spent going, oh my God, sorry, pardon that. That's okay. <laughs> but like, okay, 400 thread count. Right. 300 thread count. Right. How do I translate to that to grams per square meter, GSM? Should I? And the answer is, well, yes, I translate everything to GSM because that's at least a, a thing that I can weigh at home and test and verify yeah. where my 400 thread count and your 400 thread count right. are, One, are still. A New York Times article said batik, but didn't explain, like, what? Like, okay, sure. It's right. like tighter, whatever. Like, so we bought a bunch oh, of batik yeah. and we used it, but it was, it's just. Uh, we want a little more science in the material mm -hmm. for us. Like it's driving Absolutely. me crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a great dialogue to have though, in ter because the important features are the weave. So yeah. that is totally true. The weave, red count, if you can get it, yeah. um, red count or fiber density. Right. And then the GSM is a weight that at least allows you to normalize things. So there are some studies that are like, yes, you, and, um, denim is great, but they put a little asterisk next to it and say, but you can't breathe through it. Right. But then the take home message is that denim is the best mask right. material. And I'm like, we had one you that, can't we had some... breathe through it. It's useless. It's useless. We had, <laughs> we had a study come out that said one layer of cotton and one layer of flannel. So we made these and we sent them right. out and we we're in New Orleans and people were like, you're trying to kill us. Yeah. <laughs> like in, the, the flannel was like, there's no way that you can have flannel in the South exactly. in the summer. And people were like, no. Right. And that's, and that's a challenge of kind of like, there's a scale yeah. because, or if what you're trying to do is get N95, yeah. right? best technologies in the world for N95s are coming out of 3M. And most people who have to wear them hate them and wear them for as short a period as time, of time as you can because they're hot and humid and they're not, they're, bre they're breathable, but they're not comfortable. Yeah. Right. So in that, that's as good as you can get when you are pouring a lot of money and resources and time and technology into doing just this one thing. Yeah. So to get an N95 that gives you the particle filtration that people, uh, that has been the focus of the conversation, yeah. get that high so that you're blocking 0.3 micron, 0.1 micron. It is not very breathable, not very comfortable. Most people are not going to wear it well for very long. Right for more than 10, 15 minutes before they pull it down and I can't breathe. or take it off. Right. And so as soon as they do that, they were getting 0% particle filtration. Right. So you have to think so, about who, so the, okay. So, so who's going to wear it? Where gonna are they going to wear it? And how long are they going to wear it? Right. And what, what's the relative risk? Yeah. So in really high risk environment, Right. You know, you should wear more layers, right? That right. give you better, best particle filtration you can get. Yeah. So I use, you know, the full layers, three to three layers when I go to the grocery store with the non-woven polypropylene and I have some that's thicker and that it gives me higher degree of protection, but I don't want to wear that thing very long. When I go hiking, if I'm going to be wearing or when I go into the maker space that I've been helping out, then I wear something that's a little bit more breathable because I can wear that for four hours straight right. without taking it off, without right. touching it, readjust yeah. it. Because, right, if, yeah. you, if you're putting your hand in the middle of it and then moving right. it Right, up. you have to have it, right, so exactly. So, okay, so I have two so then, fabric questions. Yeah. And then I have, like, aesthetic questions. Okay, and then uh, right. Lex probably has a bazillion questions too. And I'm totally I'm like, license. but we just started geeking out about the fabrics and the weaves I and know, the density. It's great. And I like, love it. We haven't okay. gotten through, you know, the GSM versus thread count versus right. moms versus versus moms. Is that what you said? <laughs> oh, that's for silk, right? Right. Well, that's exactly where I'm going to. Okay. What yeah. is all this chiffon silk, 100% polyester? Like this whole list. We have a list, and it was crazy. Because it was like, 
what are we supposed to do with that? Like, what are we, like, do we add sh- and t- two layers outside, inside? Are you really spending a hundred money on 100% silk? That's $40 a yard, right? That's a lot. And is that better than, like, polyester silk? Like, I just totally lost it. it. It is very different, certainly. So when you're mixing and matching fabrics, the first thing I would say is to make sure that the washing instructions Right, then it's, okay. it's going right. to work for all of them because yeah. that's the thing that folks aren't aren't talking as much about. And also, um, in terms of how it wears out, if you have like those of you that sew a lot, if right. I think is you, right? Yeah. You know that along the seams, if you if you sew your chiffon to your canvas and denim, it's going to pull out if you're not careful. Right. Like the weight right. differential is going to mess it up. Yeah. So when people are going down these deep rabbit holes on chiffon versus silk and not giving us any information about which which of those materials they're specifically talking about, right. a lot of that is thinking about that really fine filtration. You may have right. heard that's of the electrostatic. That's what they're trying to do is the electrostatic for the teeny tiny drops. That's how you keep them from getting in. That's what they're saying. Right. The teeny tiny particles. And that's yes. how you... You, you cheat, I'm going to call it a cheat, that yeah. you get better particle filtration while still keeping breathability. And how do you feel about that? I feel like it's a challenging thing that's still very experimental. So for me, it works well because non woven polypropylene uh, holds a charge pretty well like other synthetics. Uh-huh. And so a study that just came out June 2nd was like, yay, not only do you have good filtration for lower lower weight and more, and more breathable materials, yeah. interfacing in particular, they tested they 40, 40 GSM interfacing is okay. what they tested. I think that's kind of lightweight, doesn't hold up as well, but that's a, a different rabbit hole. But the WHO guidance specifically says interfacing non-woven polypropylene interfacing um, is a good material to use. And that's based on this paper I was just mentioning, which shows the particle filtration, and they show that hydrophobic materials are able to store a charge on them. Yeah. For, well, A, they can store the charge, which cotton can't, and B, unlike other materials like silk, they keep the charge for a longer time. And they tested it both at room temperature, and they're like, score, it holds the charge overnight. That's awesome. And then they tested it at body temperature and high humidity and found that it held the charge for at least an hour, which is pretty good. And so that's where the guidance for using these synthetic synthetic layers like non-woven polypropylene and polyester are coming from is if you rub them between your latex gloves or nitrile gloves Mm -hmm. you build up a charge and they showed that if you do that for 30 seconds it builds up a charge that can last an hour even in humid conditions give you a bit of boost on the filtration okay yeah and and that is still interesting and exciting and will take extra boosts that if we can get them and it's specific for hydrophobic materials because if it absorbs water, it doesn't hold keep the static charge. We don't know how that kind of treatment is going to impact the durability. For reusable masks, if you're sitting there and rubbing the heck out of it for 30 seconds every time you wear it, right? that's going to break it down faster. Right. So it's... Like many other things, there's a trade-off there. And I'm curious to see how that pans out over time. It is whether so or not crazy, that right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very interesting. So you go onto Amazon, you find these things, non woven we're looking for non woven interfacing, polypropylene propylene, breathable, dust proof, anti fog, and then it's got some one that is waterproof and one that's not waterproof. So when they say waterproof, waterproof and breathable don't tend to go well together. 
So when I think waterproof, I think saran wrap. And saran wrap is waterproof. It does a great job at blocking particles. Right. But don't put it over your face. It is not breathable. Right. One, keep going back to this, like the, the most important feature of your mask is that it's breathable. It has to be breathable. Breathable. Right. Okay. Uh, so And not hazardous, preferably. Like. Okay. So uh, I know that people are really into, I mean, we've made a ton of cotton masks. I mean, right. a ton of yeah. them. Right. They're all yeah. over the place. And Absolutely. most of the shops are selling those too. So my thing is like, mm-hmm. okay, we may not be making them in the crazy way we were because people are, for a variety of reasons, it got political. Right. The companies are making them. People think they don't need to wear them. That's great. I don't feel like And way. also burnout. Oh my gosh. I just want to say to all the people who have been sewing hundreds, thousands, thousands, no matter how many, I have seen like the, the most heartening thing while the whole world is falling into chaos for it was exhausting so many reasons it's like watching people people just step up help out and and i know i i definitely know i agree that like spending 140 hours a week on masks for months at a time isn't sustainable and not yeah it's just exhausting i mean it was really exhausting um okay so going forward i think polypropylene is going to be hard for people to get, I would imagine. Yes? Right. Like, the question is, like, could you do something? What are your thoughts about, like, a layer of polypropylene or two layers plus cotton plus chiffon? Or, like, do you feel like this is a good thing or should we be doing all three layers like you are? Or, like, if, if people are out there freaking out, like, I have all this cotton but no pro- polypropylene, what do I do now? What do we what right. do we say? So I would say that still the best mask you have, the best mask is a mask that you can have, that you can get, that you can make. Yeah. So I don't think we should throw out all these other masks. We know that the science is evolving rapidly around us. Mm-hmm. And for a long time, my thought is that if you have some non-woven polypropylene, if you can just make a layer of it wear over your other mask, over cotton masks, then you get that water resistant hydrophobic layer on the outside. And that's the outside is key. It, you wouldn't want like a cotton and then the polypropylene. Is that what you're saying? You want the polypropylene on the outside? I want the polypropylene on the outside. Absolutely. And I think that two layers of cotton inside, one polypropylene outside, or one cotton, two non woven polypropylene, like all of those are fine. I would advise against the, the cotton sandwich, as we call it, where you have non a water-resistant non-woven polypropylene with cotton or some other absorbent material in the middle and then non-woven on the other side because of washing and disinfection. Got it. So if you were trying to wash something and you've trapped all this warm, gucky stuff in the middle, how do you make sure that, that is getting clean when you have two water resistant layers on the outside? And so before going to any combination that has that beautiful, moist, wet, absorbent middle. middle layer. Yeah, that sounds really gross. Yeah. That sounds really gross and maybe fine for a disposable mask. Yeah. But for anything reusable, that's the sort of thing that absolutely needs validated infection and cleaning methods because that scares me yeah <laughs> in terms of what it might grow in the middle so. what about, about, oh, oh. oh sorry one more thing and then lex i'm gonna have you take it along so All how right. do you feel about people that feel like look i've got kids i've got other people i need to put something cute on the outside so they wear it can i put a cotton on the outside and then do the layers so that at least they're the opposite sandwich you know cotton on the outside but the polypropylene on the inside Right. And I think that that's okay. I think that that's like, it's not, I wouldn't consider it ideal because anything that's coming from the outside is going to get trapped in that absorbent layer and you're holding it closer to the face. Yeah. But that's, that's the thing that I dislike about that. Got it. Um, but you do still have that water resistant layer in the middle that's acting as a barrier and it's helping keep things from going out and hopefully helping keep things from from going in as well. But I I have to note that both the the WHO and the CDC and all the guidance out there right now says 
that you should be using masks for source control. And the only thing you're concerned about is keeping your germs from going out. And that's and, any cotton mask then on that level, would you say and it, is okay? Right. Yeah, and some of them are going to do better than others. That's why they all say use multiple layers because one layer acts as a diffuser, essentially. It sort of spreads everything. Anyway, that gets into a longer discussion. So okay. for for what the, the government and regulatory officials say we should be doing, um, having just that non-woven layer in the middle is serves that purpose. It helps keep your droplets to you. Yeah. And then other droplets going the other way. Yeah. And the science of it, kind of when you start thinking about the nitty gritty, right. what happens if you have an absorbent layer on the outside absorb catching everything that's being thrown at you. Yeah. And then it's drying out. And so once it's dried out, it's a smaller particle size. So so I don't recommend having an absorbent layer on the outside. And I haven't seen any science, there isn't any science that I'm aware of yet that, that backs up my intuition and my, my view and analysis of why that's concerning. You think three layers of polypropylene is the best, but if you have the masks that don't have that, it's okay because it's better than nothing. And if you're trying to do a hybrid, that's not super key. Pretty much. And, and I, will, I will say that in terms of what that layer is closest to the skin, uh -huh. um, I'm not sure. Like that could, having that be cotton like the WHO recommends may yeah. be just as good okay. as having it be th all three non-woven. I find it less comfortable and too warm. Yeah. But right, this is getting into that. Yeah, personal. You know, I, yeah, so there are a lot of reasons why I still recommend the three layer. Yeah. And part of it gets into that. We, we were talking a little bit earlier about washing and disinfection, which there's a whole blog post that goes into way more scientific detail. Really than your, your site is really amazing. Okay, I promise like people... now you are going to ask the questions. <laughs> it's just I got too excited, and then I'm like, I have to ask all the questions, and I felt really bad about that. So let's I'm just going to finish the one little bit there yeah. about um, when you have the mixture of materials and fabrics and yeah. cot, especially the absorbent ones, Yeah. Um, when you wash things with detergent, yeah. Tur like you get detergent buildup and a lot of skin irritation as right. a result of. You have to use the detergent. like the, the tr detergent that's for allergy return. Yes, we have a dog who we have to wash everything with no perf We have an allergy, very allergy dog. So, yes. Right. So, fragrance free. Fragrance free, that's right. And right. Do you feel EPA like has a whole site that yeah. goes into detail, but if you're going to use detergent, keep that in mind because you're you're holding things up against your face potentially for long periods of time okay. in hot, moist environments. All right. Let's go for it before I ask another question because I keep ask, thinking about more questions. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, so um, you asked a lot of the questions I was going to ask, but so it seems like, sorry, just to dig a little bit into the details on, <laughs> oh, like, please. the moving forward. Um, oh, no. I'm getting, a new, I'm getting a call. I have a six o'clock. Oh, you do? Can we, um, um, do you need to take that call? Can we come back and chat with you as a part two just to have a confirmation? Because I know that we have like a bunch more questions. When can you chat again? Um, I can chat again. Well, I will make time to chat again because I'm so excited that Aww. you're, you want, you want more details. We do want more details. Like and we'll give us some time to read. We'll do ears. some homework and read more. Yes. Uh, what's, like, what works for you? Um, so I... I'm busy for the next hour, okay. hour and a half, and that might get too late no, on your end. For us. I'm okay with that. If you want to come back at, after your call, yeah. you want to come back in like two hours. Does that work for you? Like at seven, five, your, I don't know where you, where are you again? That'll be eight my time, but that would work for me. Yeah. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Go have your call. Thank you so much. We're so beyond excited. Thank you All right. so much. Thank you. And I'm sorry I have to run. No, no, it's going to be good. All right. Cool. All right. Yeah. Bye. Bye. All right, hold on. Where'd it go? I can't turn off the recording.
seriously. <laughs> I don't know where it went. Lex, she's amazing. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gar. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today.